Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you so much for joining us again. Today, we're, we're going to turn towards a more open discussion, directed discussion, but an open discussion in the sense that we really want to hear from folks who are participating, um, who are sitting with different hats across um, the water affordability spectrum of providers, of advocates, of researchers, and policymakers. I want to welcome Congressman Dingell. We're very pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's really great to have the opportunity to speak with you today, but to uh, uh, hear what all of you are thinking and searching, want to talk about in the policy arena, because this is um, one of the most important issues to me right now in the Congress. I firmly believe that workshops like this, where all stakeholders uh, on a subject are actively participating, coming together, are where we can find real solutions to issues uh, that do impact our communities. And this subject matters to me a great deal because I don't believe that anyone should have to live without access to safe and clean water, the fundamental human right. You know, I come from Michigan, the Flint water crisis showed the country what happens when you don't care about unsafe drinking water, when you don't care about there's lead in the water. And then when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, began, one of the first things public health experts said to everybody was you need to wash your hands regularly. And yet amid this global health emergency across the world, countless households across the world, but here in the United States, we're facing mounting bills, water turnoffs, and had no access to water. We have to, in whatever we write, write bills that will protect residents from water shutoffs, period. I can tell you, I had some whopping fights with the White House. Water is a human right. Water, you cannot survive without water. Why is shot water shut off not being declared a national emergency and the CDC preventing that? And by the way, I'm still fighting that fight. And millions of Americans are currently living in jurisdictions again without shutoff protections. And to me, that's just plain unacceptable that families in this country should fear losing access to clean, affordable water in their homes. If someone cannot afford their water bill, federal, state, and local governments should work together to help them, not punish their families by cutting off their access to water. It's just not right. The people that are the most at risk, that are the most vulnerable, don't have resources. And everybody wants to go back to normal. And we can't go back to normal. Too many people are still at risk. They need to have access to one of those fundamental human, that, that keeps you alive, the vitality. And that's to water. I'm going to just say as an aside, it's refreshing to work with the administration that gets that water equity matters in this country. The, this funding was very important to me, and I'm proud of the fact that I led it. The, it. It's once in a generation funding that would make the single largest investment in the U.S. water infrastructure ever. We've had a crisis of confidence in our drinking water systems for far too long, and the investments included in the bipartisan infrastructure law will help bring it to an end. So water is a human right. It's time we start treating it as such. Thank you for all that you all are doing and for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this morning. And uh, let's work together for water equity for every American. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Dingell. What do you see as the challenge moving it forward in the Senate and what can we do to help? I think we've got to try to get a sense of urgency in the Senate that we have to do this. We got the LIHEAP fund. I wasn't in Congress when it passed. The people recognized that people were freezing to death in the winter. And I think those programs are all great and they're important. But what's more fundamental to health than water? Water is the most important thing our bodies need. And we have to create that sense of urgency. The United States Senate never has. It's a deliberative body. But they don't get that people do not have access to water. Thank you so much again, Congresswoman Thank you. Thank you for what you guys do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. So for the first time in 30 years, we launched a new directorate. It's called TIP, not Translation, Innovation, and Partnerships Directorate. And that 
new directorate. Uh, we sort of begun about three years ago in 2019 when we launched the NSF Convergence Accelerator. And so this is really, these programs are about doing business in a different way than NSF normally does. So NSF really does try to reach out to the community and reach out to folks that you don't normally find. So we know all this, but we need to bring scientists and engineers together into that discussion. People like yourselves who deeply understand the problems that we're facing. The funding opportunities are for more than research organizations, correct? They're correct. for partners or partnerships across stakeholders. Nonprofit um, industry. So uh, if you look at the materials, it's really about bringing all the key stakeholders together to solve the problem. We're trying to uh, reach some agreement, if we can, amongst all of the people who are online and here in this room uh, with regard to the best advice we can give collectively to the full array of stakeholders in any city or any region about how to address this problem of the gap between what some people can afford to pay and what water suppliers have to charge in order to make the system go, uh, what they can do. We tried to frame three questions as a way of drawing out collective sense of priorities. What's the best way to enhance equity in the systems we're looking at? clear, uh, just from the numbers, that capital improvement matching grants administered by federal and state agencies is something which we had for a very long time, looks to be a way of helping with the equity issue. That is, if the capital costs were covered, then it would be easier for uh, utilities to set their rates or manage their rates in ways that help those who need assistance. We are making an explicit connection between a policy proposal to restore federal and state capital improvement grants with a new kind of systematic monitoring. I think the introduction of the emphasis on renters, which has just come from quite a few people, uh, needs to be added to our text to the way we talk about the results of this two-day conversation, the way in which we write about research on this question. Um, and I understand fully from a research standpoint why we focus on homeowners, because that's what we can get data on, trying to figure out which people who are renting are paying what. From a research standpoint, it's extremely difficult to learn about renters. One thing would, that would be really helpful is to have categorical eligibility, right? We already have programs where people are participating in, and I think that that's just such an easy thing to be able to do. When you look at the research, which a lot of people who run utilities don't look at research, but when you look at the research, the instance of fraud in social assistance programs is, is low. It's not negligible, but it's low. And so if you're building an assistance program based to protect against fraud, you're creating a racist program. And so the utilities have to get out of this mindset to understand you can protect against fraud on the back end. There has to be one-stop shopping for, for customers. It's out there. Our systems just don't talk to each other. Helping the utilities access their data, augment their data, that's something that outside sources could help with. And whether it's at the utility level itself or with the partners that work with the utility. And I think that you'll probably get more traction with those partners. Ed, 
under other how you think utilities should handle non-payment of water bills when they do not have sufficient funds to cover their operational costs. It's interesting that there's a 70% response rate on D, and then the next highest is raise water rates on those who can afford to pay more. We've been talking about differentiating rates so that some people can be charged less in the model that that we heard yesterday from from Philadelphia. So perhaps funding uh, for such positions uh, from the federal um, package uh, would be helpful uh, in terms of institutionalizing this approach a little bit more explicitly. The shutoff notices bring attention to the bill. And if that's, if, if that, that's what's necessary to bring people to uh, assistance, that's important. We end up shutting off a, a fraction, a very small percentage of people who get the notices. We have to change the paradigm. You're talking about people who cannot pay. They do not have the money to pay. You're not talking about the wealthy people who are choosing not to pay. So that's first and foremost, the language around it has to shift. Why not say in the water shutoff notice, you know what, instead of paying the number on the bill, why don't you pay what you have? Have a year or two of a trial run. Um, sometimes it's directing folks to those resources like making sure they know about LIWAP or ERAP, you know, ultimately getting them on that payment plan, um, getting whatever they can afford to pay has been a way to establish some of those relationships and and, you know, that just personal outreach to folks to talk through. But to your point, we are still doing turnoffs, but we kind of didn't have a choice because, you know, we're still $59 million in delinquencies. And of course, that's impacted our ability to do things. And so we've had to, we've had to cut budgets, um, but we have not cut affordability. We have definitely continued to put more money even into that, into that line item, that budget line item. The reason for putting this third question on our list to end with is to just talk about equity as a policy objective, not just as an impact, but as a policy objective. I, I want to highlight some of the things that have come up in the chat that also seem to be rather important in our discussion of thinking about differentiated base and what are perhaps some of the unintended um, consequences of perhaps uh, going with, for example, you know, hitting the, the larger industrial customers and, and Wayne um, in Seattle points out that in, in fact, uh, apartments are still considered commercial customers there. And so increasing commercial rates um, could also explicitly increase costs for low income renters. And these are exactly the kind of insights that I think are really important to highlight in this kind of discussion. In our system, we do not capture um, social security numbers. And that's, that's purposeful because we don't want to, we want to provide services to our um, immigrant and undocumented residents. And we don't report out to credit agencies for again, that same reasons. We don't think that it's our role um, so you to can't, do that. You can't really show that the most needy folks have in fact been helped by the reforms that you've adopted. The only way we can do that is by taking our collections and putting them on heat maps, taking our shutoff notices, putting them on heat maps and overlaying them with other information like census tract data, poverty data, things like that, because we don't have that information within our own system. Are there other ways that you can make the case that the changes that you've made in rates and collections and strategies of, of, of trying to meet the needs of customers um, have enhanced equity. That's the nut. <laughs> we find that the older the debt gets, the more unlikely it is to be paid. Getting those older debts cleared helps both sides because it helps us um, lower the age of our debt, which is very helpful for collections, reporting for rating agencies, things like that. You don't want to have a lot of old debt. If you clear off older debt, that's going to clear those liens off. We've seen the caps are really underfunded in a lot of places by their own admission relative to need. So more funding directed to caps in particular and more coverage in terms of caps, 
I, I think, responds to a lot of the equity concerns that have been raised the last two days. Well, there, there seems to be also the idea that there are variations in the objective of yeah. caps, right? And that perhaps making, as Susan has made the point, explicitly moving from the assistance framework to affordability framework is different, but also the process by which there is outreach that is done that could be more equitable. So how humane and how ethical are we in that outreach? And what is the language that is used? What is the approach that is used? What is the trust that is built? Um, I think came out of some of the conversations that we've had uh, today. Uh, there are, of course, remaining questions. Um, what we heard folks mention were things like, you know, how to reach the renters. That remains the perennial questions. How to reach the folks who are um, not immediately identifiable. Um, there are questions around how do we build variable rates that hit at the broader sense of community resilience and community needs and assets across different landscapes of service provision. Uh, another question that came up that uh, we haven't quite gotten to yet is that of the privatized water and the, the imminent return to that discussion in this country um, as it is in others. Thank you all. We're so pleased um, to have this group all together and we will be in touch um, again.